You could all read that, couldn't you? It's amazing, you know. We take that for absolute granted. You don't realise. Yeah, that's probably a bit. Did you want to get? You want me to not do the sermon today, Brian? <laughs> we take it so much for granted that we can read. You think about it. We actually have OHPs, or now we have these presentations where you, the congregation, you, the other participants in our service this morning, get to read. It wasn't always the case. And in many places of the world, it is still not the case. And so one of the things that we forget is how utilitarian it is to have creeds. It is something that is easy to remember. And particularly when you're in a community that doesn't have a lot of literate people, they, we've, there's lots of scientific studies that have shown that people remember things better when they don't write things down all the time. It's not saying that I don't believe in literacy, because I do believe in literacy. But one of the practical aspects of things like the creeds is that people can remember them. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to learn more about your word and allow, about those things that come forth from the inspired word of God. Be with us this morning. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be truly acceptable in your sight. But not only that, that they will build us up so that as we go out, we can live in a way that brings glory to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you know, when we talked about it the other week, the, the Apostles' Creed actually is important. One, for that reason I just told you beforehand. But also because it was a form of... Of, or a creedal statement that people used to make before they were baptised. You actually had to recite it. But the thing that we forget is that, that, that the Apostles' Creed contains so many aspects of our faith. And they're important that we grasp all of them in a sense. Now, at the other, the other night when we were discussing and doing the Bible study... I'm not saying ever that you have to be intellectually or have a high intellectual prowess to love God. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that if you are blessed with an intelligence, then one of the things that you should be doing is seeking out more about God. And the truth is, we do that of any relationship that we have. And I've used this as an illustration beforehand. If you're young and you're married, you spend the next 40 or 50 years getting to know the other person. And if you don't, we both know where it's headed. It's headed to a long, loveless marriage or it's headed to divorce. And so when we become believers, when we understand, when we give ourselves to God, when we are saved by grace, that's the beginning. And it doesn't have to be a lot of intellectual knowledge that the Holy Spirit working in us we become his. But from that point on, in the relationship, we don't want it to be a loveless marriage. We want it to be a binding together of two souls. A husband and a wife. Hence the reason that Jesus uses, or Paul, God through Paul gives the analogy. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loves the church. Wives, submit to your husbands as the church submits to God. Neither losing out. And it doesn't hurt us to become more intellectually aware because that feeds our heart, our head feeds our hearts, our hearts feed our action, our actions are our lifestyle. Now we do have to remember at the same time that the Apostles' Creed is not magic. It's not a something that you can recite and suddenly you, you've made it. It doesn't guarantee your salvation, but it does crystallize your understanding of the gospel. And it doesn't tick any spiritual box. It's not like doing no disrespect, truthfully no disrespect to our brethren across the road, but clicking the beads around the piece of string 
is a good thing. It helps you remember what you're praying for and to be consistent in prayer. But it's not magic. Just like saying this is not magic. The Apostles' Creed is a convinced, sorry, condensed theological overview that reflects that which is orthodox. And people get frightened by the name orthodox. Orthodox means adhering to correct teaching. When we look at the creeds, it is correct teaching. It is orthodox. It's what we need to know, not to be a follower, but if we are a follower of Jesus, it's what we need. It's the minimum, in a sense, of what we need to, do, need to know. So, apart from having said it when they were being baptized, they weren't just showing other people that they followed a different lifestyle. They were also showing that whole unseen realm. The thing that we Westerners, sorry, you Westerners, sorry, there's only two of us that aren't, no, three of us that aren't Westerners here. We understand that there is an unseen realm. And when you proclaim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Master, it's not just to your corporeal friends, friends with bodies. It's that whole unseen realm that you're saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty. We're saying that we accept, finally accept the grace of God that's given to us in Jesus. And that's what they were saying when they say the creed. That's what we are saying when we say the creed. We're saying everybody here, everybody out there, and the principalities and powers of this world, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and his only son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, etc., etc. That's what we're proclaiming. Why do churches push the creed out of their, 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 their order of service? Because people are then not stating what they actually believe. It's easy to walk in the church, feel good and walk out. It's hard to walk in the church, worship God, state what you truly believe so the whole universe hears who you are and then go out and live it. Because the whole universe is then against you. They're, they're actually saying when we say that, or we are saying when we say the creed, we are not giving just our theological statement, we are giving our whole world view. There is a warning that's absolutely necessary because we have to take the creed from here and here and here to out there. And the reason is this. It's in 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 7. Paul says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now get this, he is talking to the church because the next line says this, having the appearance of godliness. On the outside they look like they can say the Apostles' Creed, but on the inside... That's what's really going on. You wonder why the church is decreasing? Because that is within the church. And we need, I'm not being militant here. I'm saying we need to fight it. We need to live it every single day. Having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Paul saying avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women and men burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. I know he's talking to the church because we're always learning, but we're never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. We don't put it into action. The Apostles' Creed is the starting point of our understanding of who God is. It just tells us who God the Father is, who God the Son is, and who God the Holy Spirit is. It talks about Him being our counselor. It talks about the church, and it talks at, about our final destination. But it's the starting point. And it's not to be used as the finishing point. 
It's where we start. Because remember what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for correction, for reproof and for training in righteousness. The Apostles' Creed is the start. It's the essence that leads us into the scriptures. We are to be continually revisiting the scriptures, to mine them for the truth that's in them. But it's not just for intellectual understanding. That's where we pastors have made a mistake. Oh, so-and-so says this and -and so-and-so says this. That's true, but that's not what it's for. It's to build us all up in our holy faith so that when we go out, we live it. That it's our full lifestyle all of the time. It's not just for a word of the day. It's not just for a little devotion that gives us a good feeling. We're to be thinking about our Christianity because that's the way we are to live all of the time. Yes, we have a hope for the afterlife. And we should never forget that hope in the afterlife. But it's how we live. Remember 2 Timothy 3.17. That's the one after the one that we just read. It says this, that the man or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We're not equipped for the end so that we can drift through life and arrive at paradise's door. The reason that we're built up in our holy faith is so that we can do good work Not for salvation, but for the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is people. So the Apostles' Creed is used to give us a statement where we start something about God's nature, about the person and work of Christ, about who the Holy Spirit is, about the church, and a hope for eternity. But in this context, we actually need to understand what to believe actually means. It isn't something like, I believe in Santa, or, hmm, I reckon it's going to rain tomorrow. It's not that sort of belief. To believe in God is to have confidence in Him. It is to know that if He gives us His promise, that's what is going to happen. To believe in God means that we acknowledge his existence. Not just the fact that there is an amorphous God out there like a cloud, but we believe in him. We acknowledge his existence. We believe him to be the single God that he is. The God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. Just think for a minute of all those people out there in the world that I believe in God. Or they believe in other gods. Or they believe in a God of their own making. They believe I am God. They believe in no God, which is a God as well. When we're saying the Apostles' Creed, we're going one step further. Because simply acknowledging that there is a God is not enough. As a matter of fact, just acknowledging that they're God doesn't make them a Christian. doesn't make them godly. It just means they believe in something. Every scientist believes in something. In science. Every Hindu believes in something or lack of something. Every Buddhist is the same. What we are saying is, I believe, we're saying, I believe in the God of the Bible. I am placing my confidence in that. So it's not just, I know it exists. Because remember in James chapter 2, verse 19, it says, you believe that God is one. Yes, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. So you can believe in God, but you might not believe in God. We all believe a lot of things that don't change the way we live. I believe that the Queensland Traffic Act exists. Don't always live as though the Twins and Traffic Act exists. To believe in God means that we have a commitment to Him. 
To believe in God means it is going to change our life. Many people who believe that God exists don't do anything in light of that fact. So their belief is actually no better than that of a demon's. Faith that does not result in action. That's action within us and action without, of, without us is dead faith. Remember James chapter 1 verses 26 and 27 says, If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but, dece- sorry, does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Belief without action is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To do stuff for those that are in affliction. And to do stuff within to keep us unstained from the world. Now that doesn't mean we don't relate to the world, we don't live in the world, we don't promote God's kingdom within the world, but it just means that we don't let the world come within us and are stained by it. And it is hard. And it is a gradual purpose, a process. You're not going to wake up one morning glowing with a halo. It will take time. It will be day after day, pushing, asking the Holy Spirit and putting those, pushing those things aside. To truly believe in God as he has revealed himself, we have to believe in Jesus Christ. See, one of the things that we forget is that Jesus is God in the flesh. And it's only through him that God has shown himself to us in a way that we can understand. Moses saw God in the burning bush. He saw him in the cloud. He was hiding in the crack. But he couldn't understand him like that. We understand who God is because we have seen who Jesus is. So let's take a look properly at the Apostles' Creed. You've got to remember that for all time, all people are trying to answer those questions about creation. All people for all time have had an understanding of some sort of creation myth or creation story that helps us to understand the wonders of the world around us. Why do you think science is such a pervasive and prevalent and great look at the universe? Because we will always be wondering about it. It's in our spiritual DNA. As it says in Romans chapter 1. But what we have to remember is that our our understanding of that particular story has a, a huge influence upon us. It gives us our frame of reference. It influences the way that people think about the world and their place in the world. All mankind have to explain who we are and where we are. See, what we forget is that the Apostles' Creed, in fact, fact is the start of an understanding of the Christian worldview. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Just that particular statement. Remember Isaiah 45. Now I'm not going to go through all of the verses, but I'm going to read some of them. Isaiah 45, 5. I am the Lord. There is no other. Besides me, there is no God. We as Christians cannot allow any other God. We don't do it radically, we don't do it with guns and weapons. But what we say is there is one God who is almighty. Everything else is inferior and not God. That doesn't mean that we fight with people, but it means that when we're talking to our brethren, our brothers and sisters who are human beings of other religions, we have to simply say there is one God, and that is the God of the Bible. And Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your strength. 
That's what we believe when we say, I believe in God the Father Almighty. And even in that, the Father. The Father of what? The Father of everything created. But also the Father of Jesus Christ. The next line is, the Creator. Or the Maker of heaven and earth. We're talking about a whole world view of how we got started. And I'm not going into, I'm not going to say seven day creation or seven epoch creation or whatever. I am absolutely stating that God created the universe and everything within it. That is the thing that we have to believe. If I have, if you have brethren that say, no, it had to happen this way or no, it had to happen that way. But they believe absolutely everything else that God created, that there was an Adam and Eve, that they fell. I will be their brother in Christ. I may disagree. I have my own views on that. But there are the main things that we have to believe in. And this is one of them, that God was the creator and the maker of the whole universe. Remember Genesis 1, verses 1 to 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John 1, 1 to 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. There's a whole sermon or two in that. I believe in Jesus Christ. There's a story, Luke 2, for one. To you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour who is Christ the Lord. Jesus, fully human, at the same time fully God. How do we know? In the very next little phrase, His only Son, God's only Son. And why is He here? Encapsulated in that is John 3.16, which we know so well. For God so loved the word that he gave his only son to die. That everyone, whoever believes in him, should not perish but have eternal life. That's just the tip of the iceberg of what's hidden in his only son, our Lord. The next phrase of that. Remember Thomas says in John 20, my Lord, my master, And my God. One of the reasons, or one of the things you may not realize, I very, I will often use Lord when it's written there, but I'll often say Master. It is uncomfortable for the church today to realize that we are slaves of God. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Master. Uncomfortable is it not? True it is. John 1, 49, Nathaniel says, Rabbi or teacher, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. He's our King too. He's not only our Master, He's our King. He represents us in the court of God. And then He comes to, He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's taking for granted there that God is in three persons, that the third person of the Trinity, or the third persona of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. But it's saying that this was not the union of one human male and one human female to make a child. This was God's interaction in history, touching the womb or the egg in the womb of someone who was pleased to be the vessel of God. That's in Luke 1.35. And then it goes on. And born of the Virgin Mary. Doesn't sound like much, but it's 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 an answer to prophecy. It's an answer to, to, I forgot the word, I'm getting old. Um, heresy. They say that 
Jesus' father was actually a Roman soldier. God in his wisdom, in the wording of something that is not with the authority or the inspiration of scriptures, inspired the writers of the Apostles' Creed to put in there that little line, and born of a Virgin Mary. Why? So that we can get rid of any heresy like that. And it also states it in, Christian, in Scripture, Luke 23. It goes on and it says, suffered under Pontius Pilate. That brings in the whole world. It's not just a Jewish thing. The fate of Jesus Christ was decided by the whole world. We rejected him. John 19 and Acts 4. He was crucified. A statement of fact that it happened and attested to by so many other documents. Died. All the Gospels talk about that. Why is that important? Because did you notice that the very lie that, they, that the, the authorities put in place straight after, afterwards is he swooned. He didn't really die. He died. God in his wisdom put that in there, there then so that we now with all the people, 2,000 years later, we can't even come up with an original understanding or idea of what didn't happen or what excuse we can make. He died on the cross. Anyone that has a spear shoved in their chest that pops your heart normally dies. Unless you're Wolverine, Abel. That's a cartoon character. He was buried. He descended to the dead. I'm going quickly. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven, which is what we preached on a couple of weeks ago. He has gone from being fixed in time and space to being in the courts of heaven where he can be with God the Father and have full authority all the time. And he is seated at the right hand of the Father. We believe, but we don't think about often, we don't talk about often, is he will come again to judge the living and the dead. And I know that we say, well, we have nothing to fear, but we should in actual fact have the fear of respect, the fear of understanding that we don't live. Now, we are totally accepted by God, but we should honor our Father in such that we, that we live in such a way that it does bring glory to Him. And I'll give you an illustration. Why do you think I left Townsville in my teens? I had enough respect for the family name to leave town. How can we be Christians and still drag the family name down? We should be at least a bit ashamed or a bit frightened, but thankful for who Jesus Christ is because he is coming to judge the living and the dead. We should be being out there witnessing and evangelizing because the faith is not something that we just have inwardly. It's something that we want to promote to the whole world because they are lost too. It's hard for us to understand, but I believe in the Holy Spirit. He is the one that draws us. He's the one that calls us. He's the one that empowers us. He is the Spirit of Christ in our lives. Often neglected, always pointing to the Father and the Son. And yet so often we grieve Him and at exactly the same time we don't take into account His presence in our lives, not just as being sealed into the body of Christ, but that He is actively working within us. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. That is not the Holy Roman Catholic Church. It means the universal church. 
It means that there are allowed to be <coughs> different denominations and different sects, S-E-C-T-S, within Christianity. There can be the Orthodox. There can be Roman Catholics. There can be Baptists. There can be Uniting Church. But we are one holy Catholic Church. <coughs> we are the Bride of Christ. There can be an African church. There can be a Chinese church. We don't all have to be the same. But we all have to believe the same thing. It may work out in our cultures slightly different, the way that we worship or the things that we say. But we will all believe the same thing. <coughs> I believe in the communion of saints. We don't often understand that well enough. That means the coming together of the brethren. It means church. Oh, but I did church by myself. Sorry, you're not communing with the saints. Now, if you're sick, I totally understand that. If you've got bubonic plague or COVID, I totally get it. But the coming together, the communion of the saints is so vitally important. The forgiveness of sins. Every Sunday, truthfully, <coughs> from God's perspective when we walk in, if we have been faithful to Him or were faithful to Him, when we gave our lives to Him in saving faith, we don't have to be troubled by the forgiveness of sins because it has been forgiven. But because we're a human being and we fail, every single Sunday when we walk in here, we can be thankful for the forgiveness of sin. It has been wiped out. But remember, you do have to repent. The resurrection of the body, thank the Lord. And yes, I am making a joke of the fact that one day I'm not going to have this. I'm going to have this. But in another way, I'm not making a joke. That is the hope. Guys, that is the end and the new beginning. We have to live now and live out our faith now. The resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. And I'm going to sum up very, very quickly because I know we're getting to time. In our culture, it is still socially acceptable to believe in God. I didn't say that God or our God. I said it's still socially acceptable to believe in God. And everyone thinks that you're a bit quirky, even if we're devoted to our God or our God. It's still socially acceptable. We're seen to be slightly eccentric, but they'll go, oh, you do good things in society. They're happy about the way that we care for our fellow human beings, etc., etc. But let me warn you that one of the results of living out the summary that is in the Apostles' Creed, of being bold enough to truly make statements and live our faith, is to truly live in a way that makes Jesus supreme, to truly live in a way that says that Jesus Christ is the revelation of God, to live our lives so that <coughs> Jesus is seen to be the authority in our lives, to live our lives that takes Jesus from just a philosophy from wit or that we abide with to being the core and the centre of the lifestyle that we live. That's when it becomes difficult. There are two commandments that we have to obey. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. All your mind. That's the first one. The second one is you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Generically, Jews, Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, 
they'll all tap us on the back and say, well done. But what's not socially acceptable is when you put all of this into practice. Remember, Jesus didn't come into the world to make to pat everybody on the back. Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 39 says this, Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. He has, but he's giving you the other side now. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Because if we put the creed into practice in our lives, it will be that we love our God more. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves his son or his daughter or her son or her daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross, her cross, and follow me is not worthy of me. But whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. When we're witnessing, we have to tell the world that you can't just have a belief and a faith. Unless we have a belief and a faith in who God really is and then society will hate you. The faith has to truly include who Jesus Christ is as the Son of God. Remember Jesus in John 14 says this, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's why I like the creed. It encapsulates all of that. It is through Jesus Christ. And here's the scary part. John 5, 22 says this, For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honour the Son, just as they honour the Father. Whoever does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. And the creed helps us understand that. If anyone does not honor Jesus Christ, he does not honor God the Father. One of the things that I love about the Apostles' Creed is that it speaks of the absolute exclusivity of our faith. The absolute exclusivity of Jesus. There's no other way. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to be encouraged by the fact that you loved us so much that you sent your Son. We ask that you'll strengthen us by your Holy Spirit so that we will live in a way that reflects the fact that we believe in Jesus. And Father, I pray your blessing upon this church that we will live, that we will witness, that we will be a light, that we will be yeast, that we will leaven this community. And I pray that we will, by our lives, by our lifestyles, by our words, by our actions, bring people into the stable, bring people into the fold, lost sheep that they are. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.